This Sunday, criminal conspiracy. Former President Donald Trump is criminally charged for trying to overturn the 2020 election and hold on to power. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. This is now the third criminal indictment against Donald Trump this year. Every time they file an indictment, we go way up in the polls. One more indictment, and this election is closed out. Nobody has even a chance. As the charges mount, will his support within the party continue to grow? The fake charges put forth by the Biden sham, we call it a sham indictment, and the, you know, the man that's doing it, I really believe he's uh, mentally ill. Will his top Republican rivals continue to rally around him or start to attack him? And can our democracy survive this critical and unprecedented challenge? My guest this morning, Trump's attorney, John Laura, and Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, a member of the January 6th committee and the former lead January 6th impeachment manager. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson, New York Times chief White House correspondent Peter Baker, Republican strategist Al Cardenas, and Kimberly Atkins-Store, senior opinion writer for the Boston Globe. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. Voters next fall may be faced with an unprecedented choice, whether to put former President Donald Trump back in the White House or to essentially sign off on his sentencing if he is convicted and send him to prison or a Secret Service protected home confinement. The latest federal indictment accuses Trump of three conspiracies, one to defraud the United States, another to deprive voters of a civil right to have their votes counted, and two counts of corruptly obstructing an official government proceeding, the certification of the Electoral College vote. The indictment details how Trump was told by his vice president, senior Justice Department leaders who he had appointed, the director of national intelligence who he had hired, senior White House lawyers who he had hired, his cybersecurity agency, senior campaign staffers, state legislators, many of whom endorsed him, and state and federal courts and that there was no evidence of election fraud and that he had lost the election. Trump's campaign even paid two outside research firms to try to prove his electoral fraud claims. But they never released the findings because the firms disputed his theories and they could not offer any proof that he had won. And Trump is alleged to have repeatedly acknowledged in private that he actually lost the election, in contrast to his public statements. And yet, as the indictment lays out, it was not illegal in and of itself for Trump to lie. That is protected speech. But it was the actions the indictment alleges that he took that were illegal, using claims of election fraud that he knew were false to try to get state officials to change electoral votes, organizing fraudulent slates of electors in seven targeted swing states, deceiving them in many cases to sign on to the scheme, sending states Justice Department letters falsely claiming that there were concerns about a specific state's election outcome, pressuring Vice President Pence to use his ceremonial role to fraudulently alter the election results instead of simply certifying them. And even after an angry crowd violently attacked the Capitol, he still tried to persuade members of Congress to prevent certification. In many ways, the predicate was set here on day one of the Trump administration when the president directed his aides to insist on an easily disprovable lie about his inaugural crowd size, arguing that more people witnessed Donald Trump's inauguration than President Obama's, despite the video evidence. And a day later here on Meet the Press, the president's counselor, Kellyanne Conway, offered this awkward explanation. You're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains... Wait a minute. Alternative that facts? There's... Look, alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. So his presidency began with alternative facts and apparently ended with alternate electors. And it may all add up to a scenario where voters have to decide whether to put Trump back in the Oval Office before he is sentenced. Let's not forget that Republican senators decided to, not to hold the president accountable via the process that the founders believed was the better process for this, impeachment. In fact, this was Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell explaining his vote to acquit Trump after January 6th. 
President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation. And former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. So instead of doing the tough work in the Senate, they left it to the voters who are going to be stuck with the burden of upholding the rule of law if Trump is convicted. An unprecedented test of our democracy. Prosecutors have asked the judge in the January 6th case to issue a protective order over discovery evidence after Trump posted this on Friday on social media. If you go after me, I'm coming after you. Citing Trump's habit of attacking judges, attorneys, and others associated uh, with legal matters pending against him. And while they claimed that social media post was on something else, not on this, last night in South Carolina, Trump uh, didn't do anything uh, subtly. He attacked special counsel Jack Smith directly. Deranged Jack Smith. He's a deranged human being. You take a look at that face, you say, that guy is a sick man. There's something wrong with him. And joining me now is one of Donald Trump's attorneys in this specific case, John Laurel. Mr. Laurel, welcome to Meet the Press. Good morning. Uh, let me start with this. Is the defense to this indictment he didn't do it uh, or he was allowed to do what he did? The defense is quite simple. Donald Trump, President Trump, believed in his heart of hearts that he had won that election. And as any American citizen, he had a right to speak out under the First Amendment. He had a right to petition governments around the country, state governments, based on his grievances that election irregularities had occurred. He had every right to speak about the important issues that were taking place after the election. Certainly, Mr. Pence, his vice president, agreed with him that there were anomalies and discrepancies in the election process. And Mr. Trump had every right to petition government and enforce his First Amendment rights. That's why this indictment is an attack on the First Amendment. The government, the Biden administration, would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that President Trump did not believe that he had won the election. They will never be able to do that. And that's why this prosecution is so ill-conceived. You know, you, you mentioned that he had the right to do all these things. Well, he did all of those things. He filed his petitions in court. He got a couple of recounts. Um, all of the, he, he, everything you outlined as saying he had the right to do, he did have the right to do. He executed that strategy. And apparently when he didn't get the result that he liked, then he kept looking for another strategy. I, at what point uh, does he accept the truth that he didn't win? Well, he believes he won. And the Biden administration will never be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he didn't. But what he's being indicted for ultimately is following legal advice from an esteemed scholar, John Eastman, that he could petition his own vice president and ask his vice president to pause the voting on January 6th to give the states one last chance to certify or re-audit. That was the ultimate ask that President mm -hmm. Trump made in his ellipse speech. That's clearly protected. Let's go back, if we could, and see what was going on on January 6th. Both Vice President Pence and, and President Trump saw that they had 10, mil 10 million votes more than they had in 2016. No president has ever lost under those circumstances. They also saw that Joe Biden outperformed Hillary Clinton by 15 million votes, even though she was an insp inspirational candidate and Joe Biden was sitting uh, at home in his basement. They yeah. also saw that President Trump won almost all of the disputed counties. In addition, in addition, they had over a thousand uh, people come forward and under oath say that there were discrepancies in the election. And finally, and most importantly, what what President Trump and Vice President Pence yeah. saw were that the rules of the game had been changed by local electoral officials, contrary to the state legislature. So he took what he was entitled to do, which was petition yeah. uh, Vice President Pence on January 6th. Once that petition was completed and Vice President Pence rejected his position, it was over and there was a peaceful transition of power. I'm going to look, I got to unpack a couple of those things there because uh, you're some of it is just sort of political spin, and, and, and I understand that. But let me get to this issue of the esteemed legal scholars. No, it's scholars. part of our legal Hang defense. Hang on a minute. The esteemed, I understand that. The esteemed yeah. legal scholars. 
Here's what the former Attorney yeah. General Bill Barr said about that strategy. I want to get you to react to it. I don't think this defensive uh, advice of counsel uh, is going to go forward because I think the president would have to get on the stand and subject himself to cross-examination in order to raise that, and he'd also have to waive attorney-client privilege. Is the president gonna, former president going to take the stand? Advice of counsel can be raised without anyone taking the stand. That's just plain wrong. But what we had was a very, very thoughtful memo by John Eastman, who was a, a professor of law, dean of a law school, head of a constitutional scholarship program, and well, well understood and well renowned. He had been a Supreme Court clerk uh, and a Fourth Circuit clerk, even Mike Pence said he was the legal scholar that was developing a lot of these points. People disagree about constitutional principles all the time. Certainly, uh, Mr. Barr may have disagreed with uh, Mr. Eastman. Mm -hmm. That happens every day in our government. It never leads to a criminal charge. But one thing for certain, uh, President Trump acted under the advice of counsel when he petitioned so, under the First Amendment, right. petitioned Mr. Pence. So and, let me understand and that's this. legally Are, protected if, speech. If, so what you're arguing is if the president did violate the law, he did so because he got advice from counsel to violate the law? No, that's what people misunderstand. In order to have a violation of law, you have to have criminal intent, and in this case, corrupt intent. And what that means is that you have to have some desire to do something unlawful. Mm -hmm. if, your, if your attorney is telling you that you have a right to petition Congress, yeah. then that completely eliminates any criminal intent. So under those circumstances, you are not violating the law. Your actions require right. you to state your position, but it's not a, it's not a violation, so you would be acquitted. Let me regardless get you to of respond. Your contact, well, you re regardless keep, of your conduct. Right, I understand. You keep uh, saying some certain things that, that Vice President Pence apparently agreed with. Let me play what Vice President Pence says the former president asked him to do. Here's what he said he was asked to do. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear on this point. It wasn't just that they asked for a pause. Uh, the president uh, specifically asked me, and his gaggle of, uh, of crackpot lawyers asked me, to literally reject votes, to, which would have resulted in, uh, in the issue being turned over to the House of Representatives, and literally chaos would have ensued. So he's just disputing the, the version of events you're describing? No, not at all. He's substantiating it. In, in this respect, there were some preliminary discussions along the lines that Vice President Pence described, but the ultimate ask which was done uh, at the ellipse, was to pause the voting for a period of time. Now, issues like this get discussed and thrashed about all the time. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate, the ultimate call made by President Trump was to ask for a pause. If you read Vice President Pence's book, he agrees completely with President Trump that there were these anomalies, discrepancies, even fraud in the election. Vice President Pence wanted those debated uh, in Congress President Trump yeah. asked that they be debated at the state legislature. So you had a disagreement there. But once again, these kinds of constitutional and statutory disagreements don't lead to, to criminal charges. And one thing right. that Mr. Pence has never said is that he thought President Trump was acting criminally. Indeed, Vice President Pence is an attorney. If he at any point said or thought that, that Mr. Trump, President Trump, was acting unlawfully or contrary to criminal law, he would have said that. No one ever suggested that. Uh, President Trump was you know, exercising actually he his has right. said that. And by the way, there's another... He said the president asked him to violate the Constitution. No, never, he said the president asked him to violate the Constitution, no, which is another way of saying he, he asked him to break said, the law. He never said... No, that's wrong. That's wrong. A, a, a technical violation of the Constitution is not a violation of criminal law. That's just plain wrong. And to say that is contrary to decades uh, me, right. of, of, we're, we're, uh, legal, we, like, of legal statutes. Let's get out but of let the Constitution. Let me say one last thing, if I could. Go ahead. Well, no, because this is a constitutional case. This is, this is going to be the most important civil rights constitutional case in decades. And there's one other issue that's very important. Everything that President Trump did was while he was in office as a president. 
he, he is now immune from prosecution for acts that he takes in connection with those uh, policy so decisions. So you're going to you're going to try to administration has has not addressed that. A, a, an in, interesting uh, legal place you're going to go that will also create some constitutional questions. I want to get you to respond though to something that seems a bit more straightforward on uh, intent. It's the infamous phone call in Georgia. Let me play an excerpt. The ballots are corrupt, and you're going to find that they are, which is totally illegal. It's, it's, it's more illegal for you than it is for them, because you know what they did, and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. If he had proof he won the state, why did he threaten the Secretary of State with a criminal, uh, with, with, a, that, with a criminal charge? That wasn't a threat at all. What he was asking for is, is for Raffensperger to get to the truth. He believed that there were in excess of, of 10,000 votes that were counted illegally. And what he was asking for is the Secretary of State to act appropriately and find uh, these votes that were counted um, illegally. Uh, that was an aspir. Hold on one second. That was an aspirational ask. He's entitled to petition even state government, but that doesn't that doesn't involve an obstruction of federal government. But what the Biden administration has said is somehow President Trump obstructed a federal proceeding. That relates to what was going on in the states, and yeah. President Trump had every right to ask the Secretary of State. I believe that this election was conducted improperly. There are deficiencies here. I want to see if there are more than 10,000 votes or whatever the number was that were counted illegally. Once again, that's core political speech. Bringing up a criminal violation is somehow speech. I mean, it's the way it sounds like somebody saying that's a mighty fine, uh, it's a mighty fine restaurant you have there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. I mean, that's, it's no different than, I mean, oh, it's, it's a big threat have, here have to read, bring up a criminal offense. Have you read the First offense. Amendment? <laughs> oh, no, no, Chuck, have you read the First Amendment? I mean, political speech is the most protected speech um, that we have under our Constitution. It's important to go back and read the text of the First Amendment. So you can actually say that a government official is acting criminally. That's protected by the First Amendment. If mm -hmm. we lose the First Amendment rights, then, then heaven forbid we lose the right to freedom right, of the press. For, we lose the right for me to appear. We lose the right, we lose the right for you to you're, speak. You're not, you can, allow, you're you not allowed say, to use speech. Th you're not allowed to use speech, though, in order to get somebody to commit a crime. And what he was directing Raffensperger to, to do you're was to, to advocate. So you have to. No, you're saying he no, didn't commit a crime. You, you haven't. You you haven't read the cases because, for example, uh, you can encourage someone not to register for selective service. I could I could see you, Chuck. You mm -hmm. know, registering for Vietnam, and I can go up to you and say, Chuck, don't register for that war. It's illegal. And I violated the law. Keep walking. Go home. No, that's protected speech. My speech no, is protected. Right. That's the point. You coerced me to I, violate the law. I, I can ask you. I can, no, no, no. And by the way, there's a Supreme Court case. You got to read it right on point. A Hammerschmidt. And it says that's not illegal. You know, we can have this discussion, but people need to start looking carefully at what our country stands for, what the Constitution stands for. It applies to President right. Trump just like it applies to everyone else. To, if we eviscerate right. our First Amendment rights, we will no longer have a country where people can freely speak their minds. Have, have you been able to find any evidence? I know the campaign paid for two studies that didn't find any evidence that would uh, find enough fraud to overturn the election. Have you found any evidence yet? Because you have said you plan on relitigating There's the 2020 election, and nobody has found any evidence to back up Donald Trump's claims, and it's been two and a half years. We will be litigating the 2020 election because much of that has not been litigated. But what we do know, which is not in dispute under any circumstances, is that local state election officials changed the rules in the middle of the game. They sent out absentee ballots. And, and all of, hang on. They I, look, I understand. You, you said this a, a Can few I finish? times. Are, you asked not on me this one question, because you're not, allowed, this you're not was allowing all, me to finish. Mr. Laura, no, 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 you're not all of this was litigated. You're, Mr. You're, Laura, like, you're like the uh, Biden... No, 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 no. You, no, don't, no, no. Don't that's get not, politics with you, me. You don't understand. I've allowed you to filibuster a lot. No, no, no. I'm, I'm getting to, legal with you. All of this, Mr. No, no. Laurel, every no, single... I'm, 
Go ahead. No, you're, no. You're trying to make a. Uh, you're trying to create a confrontation is, for no reason. But no, go ahead. No, this is. N no, I don't. I don't want to, Chuck. I'm just trying to let you know that the criminal rules are different than what you're talking about. In a criminal case, the government has a burden of proof. What we don't have any requirement to prove anything. All we have to do is put the government to its test. And one of the things that, that will be shown at trial is that there were these um, institutional anomalies where state election officials unlawfully broke the law. And Mr. Trump was entitled to petition government and, and assert that he was right. Yeah. That's part of the First Amendment protection. We don't have to prove fraud. People don't understand that. All we have to do right. is that President Trump yeah. was acting uh, in, with his with his conviction that right. this election I, was conducted improperly. Right. I just want to let viewers know that everything you've said and, and all that he actually went to the courts. All of this was uh, was actually deemed legal that was done in the states. All of this was. But look, we're not debating not this. True. I got one That's last question for you. False. I need to get yeah. you to react to yeah. what your client is saying about the prosecutor. Here's what he said last night. Deranged Jack Smith. He's a deranged human being. You take a look at that face, you say, that guy is a sick man. There's something wrong with him. Do you believe he's deranged? President Biden in April of 2022 said he wanted President Trump prosecuted and he wanted him out of the race. He repeated that in November of 2022. Uh, as a result, President Biden has put in motion a political prosecution in the middle in the middle of an election season and obviously everything is open to politics i'm not involved in politics i'm just representing a client i'm ensuring that justice is done in this case president trump is entitled to his day in court and he'll get it right do innocent people attack prosecutors this is a political campaign right now this prosecution was instituted by president biden and in the middle of that campaign, people are going to speak out. My role is not to address anything about uh, prosecutors. But I will say this. There has been a history in the Justice Department of rogue prosecutions. They went after Arthur Anderson, a major, uh, a major accounting firm, destroyed the, destroyed the company. And, and the DOJ lost 9 nothing. They, they went after the, the former governor of Virginia. Uh, in a prosecution, a Republican governor who was convicted unfairly, reversed nine nothing. And now the Justice Department, the Biden Justice Department, is going after a former president for acts that he carried out in fulfillment of his oath as president right. of the can United the, States. Are you confident that the former president can be trusted with discovery and isn't going to weaponize what he learns about Mark Meadows or others who may be cooperating? Well, I'm shocked, and, and I can find you a lawyer to, to address this, but I'm shocked that all the news media outlets aren't protesting what the government is trying to do. They're trying to say that we have discovery that's not sensitive, but we don't want the press to hear about it. And, and Mr. Trump, our team is saying, President Trump is saying, that if there is evidence out there that the government has that's exculpatory or informative, then the press has a right to know. But the Biden administration doesn't want the press to know that. And I'm shocked that there aren't petitions now filed in the district court opposing what the Biden administration is doing. John Lauro, the uh, defense attorney for the former president. Appreciate you coming on and sharing your uh, legal perspective with us. Thank you, sir. Good to see you, as always. Thank you. When we come back, Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, the former January 6th committee member and former lead impeachment prosecutor. Next. Welcome back. For more than two years, Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin has been laying out the case, first for impeachment, then for criminal prosecution of Donald Trump's conduct before and on January 6th. As the lead impeachment manager, Raskin argued before the Senate that Trump should be convicted for incitement of insurrection, making arguments which sound familiar today. President Trump tried to bully state-level officials to commit a fraud on the public by literally finding votes. We saw him trying to get state legislatures to disavow and overthrow their popular election results and replace them with Trump electors. And as a member of the House's January 6th Select Committee, it was Raskin that presented the committee's recommendation that the Justice Department charge Trump with four counts, obstructing an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to make a false statement, and assisting in an insurrection. 
while the special counsel chose not to charge Trump with inciting or assisting in the insurrection or for false statements. But he did charge him with the other recommendations in addition to adding the conspiracy against rights. So joining me now is the Democratic congressman we have been referring to there, Jamie Raskin of Maryland. Congressman Raskin, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks for having me. Um, let me first start with a couple of things we heard from Mr. Lauro. You spent 25 years as a constitutional law professor, so I kind of want to get Professor Raskin's take on this. Let me play one quick clip of something he said to me about the Constitution. A technical violation of the Constitution is not a violation of criminal law. That's just plain wrong. Now, he added the word criminal law there, but I, it was my understanding if you violate the Constitution, you have violated the law. Well, first of all, a technical violation of the Constitution is a violation of the Constitution. The Constitution in six different places opposes insurrection and makes that uh, a grievous constitutional offense. Mm -hmm. um, so our Constitution is designed to stop people from trying to overthrow elections and trying to overthrow the government. But in any event, there's a whole apparatus of criminal law which is in place to enforce this constitutional principle. That's what Donald Trump is charged with violating. Mm -hmm. He conspired to defraud the American people out of our right to an honest election by substituting the real legal process mm -hmm. we have under federal and state law with counterfeit electors. I mean, there are people who are in jail for several years for counterfeiting one vote. If they try to vote illegally mm -hmm. once, he tried to steal the entire election. And the, his lawyers up there mm -hmm. saying, oh, that's just a, a matter of him expressing his First Amendment rights. That's deranged. That is a deranged argument. He also seemed to hint that everything he did as president can't, may not be, it may not be constitutional that he's charged with this. It sounds like the old Nixon defense. You know, I can do it because I was president. Well, first of all, he's charged as part of a conspiracy. Uh, so there were lots of people who were involved in doing it. But in any event, uh, the law that applies to the rest of us also applies to the president of the United States, a principle they understood very well during the impeachment when mm -hmm. they were saying, well, let's not do it during the impeachment because he's already left office. Deal with this as a matter of criminal law. That's what Senator McConnell said. That's what a bunch of the Republicans said. Now it's mm -hmm. like a three-card Monty. You can't get him for uh, impeachment because he's already left office, but you can't get him for criminal law because he once was president. I mean, America can see what's going on here. This is a guy who wants to appoint himself completely immune mm -hmm. from the rule of law that applies to the rest of us. Um, they chose, he chose not to charge insurrection. It sounds like Jack Smith wanted to avoid a, a, de a debate over the First Amendment. Well, there's a, a criminal statute aiding and abetting mm -hmm. or giving aid and comfort to insurrectionists, which, to the mind of the January 6th committee, Donald Trump definitely did. Right. I mean, he's calling them great patriots. He's saying, never forget this day. He continues to laud them to this very day and saying that when he gets back in, he's going to pardon all mm -hmm. of those people. I mean, they're convicted of assaulting our police officers, and he's talking about pardoning them. A lot of them have pled guilty to seditious conspiracy, right. conspiracy to overthrow the government. So, um, yeah, but he's being charged with conspiracy to obstruct the federal proceeding, right. the joint session of Congress, and conspiring I, to defraud us all out of our voting rights. He tried to steal the election away from us. Do you... Do you uh, do you like how Jack Smith did this, or do you wish he had added the incitement? No, I think that I understand there were prudential and tactical reasons for mm -hmm. doing what he did, and I think it's excellent because the basic point is the deprivation yeah. of our civil rights. Abraham Lincoln said it best. He said, an insurrection, an attempt to topple an election, is a an attack on the first principle of government, which is the right of the people to choose their own leaders. When you read the indictment, it's really strong on the alternate elector slate, right? There is actions that are specific actions that are taken. It really sort of throws away the whole speech defense because it was, you start to see everything. During the impeachment trial, you didn't have the scope of the alternate elector scheme. Obviously, by the time you guys impaneled the committee, you did. Do you think it would have made a difference? If you had had sort of the scope then? Well, I think it it should have made a difference psychologically for the senators like McConnell who voted no. But, yeah. it, you know, in a juridical sense, what they were saying was that the Senate did not have jurisdiction to try Trump because yeah. he was a former president. Now, seven Republicans rejected that. All 50 Democrats rejected that. It was a 57 to 43 vote to 
convict him of inciting a violent insurrection against the union, which was the most widespread bipartisan vote in American history right. to convict a president. And of course, you know, Trump is bragging about the fact that only 57 senators voted to convict him of that. He beat the constitutional spread in his way. But I think that uh, he's met his match now mm -hmm. uh, in a special counsel who is holding him to the letter of the criminal law. We're going to have a campaign that is going to be filled with a lot of whataboutisms. We know the Republicans are going to talk about Hunter Biden a lot here. Um, and I know that the, a lot of the technical defense of, of the president with Hunter Biden is, well, the president didn't do anything wrong. But as Michael Kinsley once said, the real scandal in Washington is not what's illegal, it's what's legal. Should there be a code of conduct, something for family members here? Because it, the appearance of what Hunter Biden did is, is not good. Yeah, I mean, we know that there is a lot of, um, you know, influence in Washington that's based on people's family connections. And Last family names ties. matter a lot on K Street, as you know. You know, and I have... Um, repeatedly asked Chairman Comer on the Oversight Committee for us to look at that in a serious and substantive and methodical and nonpartisan way. But he's per instead decided to just pursue the Hunter Biden thing as a one-off, as a way to score cheap political points. He doesn't want to talk uh, about Jared Kushner, who brought back $2 billion, not million, $2 billion from Saudi yeah. Arabia to a company he created the day after the Trump administration ended, when there was still blood all over the Capitol. Let me ask you this. Why do you think a thrice-indicted former president is neck and neck with the current president? Well, it's a great question. I wish that Lincoln were around to pose it to him, because it's his political party that they've dragged into the mud here. I mean, that was a pro-freedom, anti-slavery, anti-know-nothing, pro-immigration yeah. party, and now it's become a cult of authoritarian personality. Um, and, you know, even the candidates running against Trump dare not challenge his clear betrayals of his constitutional oath. Donald Trump knew exactly what he was doing, and we had lots of testimony about that before the January 6th committee. His own White House no. counsel told him that he was wrong. The Attorney General of the United States, who was like the biggest sycophant of the right. Trump administration, said the arguments he was following were BS. And so he had to have known 60 federal and state courts rejected every argument about electoral fraud and right. corruption they brought forward, and still he went ahead. And even if he did believe it, as his lawyer saying, yeah. which I don't think he did, but even if he did, it makes no difference. You might believe that your bank owes you some money. You don't have a, a right to go rob the bank. And, and get that money back. Jamie Raskin, uh, Democrat from Maryland. Appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. President Trump now faces a total of 78 felony counts across three criminal cases, and more criminal charges could be coming in the state of Georgia later this month. Why is Trump's legal jeopardy fueling more support, it appears, from within the party? Panelists next. Welcome back, panelists here. NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson, anchor of Hallie Jackson Now. Peter Baker, the chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. Republican strategist Al Cardenas and Kimberly Atkins Storr, senior opinion writer for the Boston Globe. Both of you have law degrees. <laughs> Three of us don't, but that's okay. I'm glad to get more, more, more legal help here. Um, here's what Donald Trump said last night uh, about his current legal predicament. Every time they file an indictment, we go way up in the polls. We need one more indictment to close out this election. One more indictment, and this election is closed out. Nobody has even a chance. We've already defeated the Republicans. Hallie Jackson, that was actually Friday night. He had done had rallies both Friday night and last night there. Uh, he's been right so far. Fair. And there's new polling out even today that shows more than half of Republicans think that these indictments against Donald Trump are an attack like an attack against people like them. Right. He is reflecting and channeling what he hears from his base, from the people who support him, from his loyalists. The dynamics seem unlikely to change at this point. The question is, what dynamics change for those who are hoping to dethrone Donald right. Trump as the king of the Republican Party? We've seen this sort of semi sharpening of tone yeah. from Ron DeSantis, semi sharpening of tone from Mike Pence, who's now the central figure. Um, I know we'll talk about that more in a sec. No, I'm going to give you the montage of the candidates now, and you'll see <laughs> the array of those at the bottom of the polls with tough rhetoric, those closer to Trump with not so tough rhetoric. Here it is. 
Anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. It's another sad day for America. I mean, now we have a former president that's under indictment three times. In D.C., they will go after you if you're a Republican. The facts be damned. Republicans don't have a fair shot there. DOJ continues to weaponize their power against political opponents. It seems like they spent a lot of time protecting uh, Hunter Biden and Democrats. Like most Americans, I'm tired of commenting on every Trump drama. I've lost track of whether this indictment is the third, fourth, or the fifth. Al Cardin, as you saw there, those that, that basically are at the bottom of the polls feel comfortable criticizing the former president. Those that think they can win the nomination are trying to go after the process. Is that any way to win? Well, look, at this point in time, uh, Donald Trump has effectively tied uh, the indictments to Joe Biden and a political maneuver. Uh, once these cases go to trial, if he's indicted by a grand jury, the facts change, yeah. the circumstances change, and this is no longer about Joe Biden. This is about Grand jury, this is about a jury yeah. who has convicted him of very serious crimes. And if that leads to a, a sentencing hearing, that's a whole new set of circumstances. And so, so far it works well. Uh, are we forecasting that it'll continue to work well through the election? And not if there's a conviction by a jury of his peers. I mean, Peter, the likelihood that this trial is sometime after the primaries and before the convention is pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. So whether everybody's fully focused on it now, I understand it's like, oh, another Trump indictment. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go to the beach. Um, come April or May of next year, that won't be the case. That's right. And it'll be showcased day after day after day after day. And the Republicans at that point will have largely chosen their nominee, right? And they'll be stuck with him if they decide yeah. that they want to switch games. Now, the convention will be afterwards, presumably. Somebody could try to engineer something at the convention if he is convicted and they decide maybe we should have a rule mm. about not having a convicted felon as our Yeah, how's that going to go over like with Republicans? Well, at that, the moment, not. Yeah. Right. That in many states, delegates yeah. are legally tied yeah. to the person mm. they voted. But yeah. politically ahead, speaking, yeah. with this indictment in particular, it naturally blunts what Donald Trump's biggest argument is, is what they're coming after me to come after you, meaning Trump supporters. The count in the indictment, count four, talks about how Donald Trump attacked the civil rights of every American. It was the opposite. He was not protecting you. He was attacking you for his own political power in the most uh, authoritarian way mm -hmm. possible. That will naturally blunt it in the same way that we saw after the January 6th uh, committee mm -hmm. hearings. We will see that. We could see that shift. I still go back to what if you don't debate Trump on this. Well, so How else are you going to get into the primary discussion? Uh, and I talked with one person um, close to former Vice President Mike Pence mm -hmm. in, in preparation for today who said, listen, he's leaning into it now because if he doesn't, then when? Right? He's selling hats that say too honest because otherwise, when was he going to do what it? What choice does he have? That's exactly yeah. right. He's going to be on that witness stand. He's going to be, you know. And by the way, know, but the person I talked to stand. didn't didn't rule that out, you know, pointed to the fact that the former Vice President has written a lot about it in his book, but this is a guy who, you know, believes in the rule of law, et cetera. On the other side, I've spoken with a, a, a source in DeSantis world as well, who said, you will also hear more from DeSantis about this, not because DeSantis wants to be talking about it, but because their new strategy now as part of this post-campaign reset is to get DeSantis out talking more, doing more media, doing more interviews. They think he's going to get asked you repeatedly. You know, Al, if Biden led by 10 points in a general election matchup and Donald Trump, Republicans would be having a different conversation, wouldn't they? Hmm. Oh, of course they would. Yeah. And you got to think about the consequences. There's an election and there are people in the ballot in Congress and in the states, and they want one thing more than anything else, to get elected or reelected. They're afraid of alienating those Trump supporters, aren't They're they? They're afraid of alienating them. And then, but then, you know, Trump's numbers keep staying up. They're not going to speak against Trump. A conviction takes place, that circumstances change. You know, there might be a mad scramble. And, and Kimberly, they may impeach. They may just go ahead and go with an impeachment as a way to, quote, be counter... In fact, one of these Fox News commentators suggested it as counter-programming. Yeah, that just shows how badly broken they are willing to break the Constitution um, yeah. as opposed to lose an election. And I think that's exactly what Democrats would need to point out politically to make very clear to voters as we head into this really consequential election. All right. We are headed to the abyss, and we don't seem to have anybody figuring out how to pull us out. When we come back, a conservative boycott of Bud Light is causing real trouble for the world's largest beer maker. Americans are divided over whether companies should take stands on political issues. Data Download is next.
Welcome back. Data download time this week. Anheuser-Busch announced a 10.5% decline in their second quarter revenue, and it was primarily due to a consumer boycott of Bud Light after the brand partnered with a transgender influencer for an Instagram ad. But it's not just Bud Light that's been the target of boycotts. For the most part, Americans, they seem less than excited when any company takes any sort of political stance. Let me show you this. Overall, as you see here, 58% think it's inappropriate for companies to get involved in politics. When you look at it by political party, uh, Republicans are the most against it, but independents don't like it. Democrats are basically split down the middle. Now, have you boycotted? Have, do you do these things when companies take stands? As you can see, more people boycott than buy when a company takes a stand. And that is across the board. A majority of Republicans boycott. As you can see, it's a plurality of independents and a plurality of Democrats. Again, take a company stand, you're going to cost yourself money. Bud Light, Chick-fil-A, we've seen it. Left or right, it doesn't seem to matter. Now, a few other things we've learned here. Who does the boycotting? Who's most impacted? Well, not surprisingly, income matters here. The more you make, the more comfortable you might be. Uh, thinking that a company can take a political stand. The less you make, the more inappropriate it is because you know what? You don't want to know about the politics. You just want the cheapest product. Also of note, there's a bit of an age disparity here, which may be something Anheuser-Busch didn't really figure out. Younger, vote, uh, younger folks don't mind companies taking stands. Older folks can't stand it. Perhaps too, a lot of older folks drink Bud Light, not younger ones. The threat of a third-party candidate is becoming more likely in the 2024 race as voters say they are opposed to another Biden-Trump rematch. Joe Manchin, of course, is flirting with a run, a run as a centrist backed by no labels. Cornell West is seeking the Green Party nomination. Well, in 1980, as Jimmy Carter faced off against Ronald Reagan, a matchup that some people didn't like, Republican Congressman John Anderson of Illinois decided to leave his party and launch an independent bid. Here's how he pitched his candidacy on this program. In contrast to these two, both of them ex-governors, I think I represent the broad political center of this country. I will make it abundantly clear that you don't have to go back to some prior decade to find the solutions to the problems of the future. You don't have to be content with the kind of demonstrated incompetence that we have seen in the White House for the last four years, that there is a third way. And I represent that third approach uh, for the American voter. John Anderson would end up winning less than 7% of the vote. When we come back, as former President Trump went to court on Thursday, President Biden went for a bike ride. What that split-screen moment tells us about how President Biden plans to handle his potential rival's legal drama. Welcome back. I want to start with something that uh, Toulouse Olonaripa wrote yesterday in the Post, Peter Baker. Country lacks a unifying voice in the aftermath of Trump charges. The indictment's aftermath has showcased that the country lacks a trusted singular voice of moral authority, one who could speak out on one of the most contentious and consequential judicial actions in political history. We are staring into the abyss, on the edge of the cliff. We can pick our, 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 our metaphor, but the rule of law is on the ballot, and, and, and you know nobody's reassuring us right now that no. everything's going to be okay. That's right. And institutions as a whole are all under attack or their faith is, uh, is is being diminished, whether it be the Supreme Court, Congress, the media, of course, obviously, right. that, and now the justice system, right? Because now increasingly, largely because Trump is out there telling people this, a lot of Americans believe the justice system can't be trusted. The courts and the prosecutors and the Justice Department, well, what did John Lord say to you over and over again? He didn't say the special mm -hmm. counsel. Yeah, he he didn't say the Justice Department. Right. He said the Biden administration, right? Obviously, in a strategic choice on their part to make this as political and partisan as possible, but it actually works. And a lot of people don't yeah. believe in the system now. The, Look, puts the president in an awkward spot. I was just going to say, yeah. the issue with that is that while John, John Loro and the, the Trump team are lashing this decision by the special counsel to the Biden administration, it's a bit of a one-sided fight because the Biden administration, the White House, and a, a Biden advisor tells me this, all of you, I'm sure, too, yeah. they have, they feel like they absolutely want to be keeping this arm's length distance because otherwise it undermines, and this is me speaking here, otherwise it undermines minds everything that President Biden said he would do, which is not interfere with the workings of the Justice Department. Um, I, I wonder, though, if that doesn't create some dissatisfaction among Democrats who would like to see a more muscular response. It should. If it hasn't, it should. There is a way for Biden, the president, to say this is a special counsel. And I am demonstrating how a president does not just rule a, a Justice Department, but certainly keeps hands off an independent special counsel from what they're doing. But at the same time, candidate Biden has to say, look, 
I am the candidate who will continue to protect the right to vote, to protect the rule of law. I am the president that signed the Electoral Count Reform Act. I am this, the other person is the president who was charged with trying to subvert democracy. He has to be able to make that that claim. That has to be the top part of his campaign going into 2024. If he can't enunciate that message, he's in trouble. All I know is that the country is more unhappy than it's ever been before. The political system seems to be broken. More than 50% of the voters don't like either candidate. You've got almost two years worth of divisive trials coming up. Uh, you've got so much at stake in this country. You've got foreign wars. You've got global uh, stress. This country is going to go through 18 months that will truly test our ability to remain a strong United Nation. And uh, I think we're all wondering if we have the leaders it. to meet the moment. Right. I don't I, know if we do. Yeah. I'm look very at, worried. Look at, look at Biden's numbers now, right? Okay. In a lot of ways, things are going well for him now. Inflation is down. Mm -hmm. Unemployment is really low. Growth is up. Crime, immigration, all these indicators are off their peaks. And yet his approval rating is the one thing that's not changing. It is stubbornly where it has been now for two years. Do we think they're punishing? But look, Trump's numbers never moved. Is just elected leaders getting punished for this horrible political depression everybody feels? Like, you know, we talk about economic depressions. We're in a political depression, not a recession, mm. a right. depression. I feel like they punish all elected leaders over this. Yeah, I think that's true, but it's also we haven't had a new generation come up yet to have a chance to test themselves and to present a new a new voice and fresh faces because the older generation is still hanging on, basically. Which well, is why we were talking briefly about third or fourth options in yeah. our country. Uh, this country cannot stand for long this disruption. And there's no doubt in my mind that third and fourth options will rise. If our system allowed for it better, it'd be a home run. Yeah. yeah. The problem is our system makes it so hard, so hard. you know, to do this. But you're, it, the pressure is building at some point. This well, I think this no-labels group has started the effort. They've now qualified in about 12 states, yeah. I think. They'll keep it going. Others Come April or May, same. when we're in a trial, yeah. Yeah. people are going to be shopping. They may end up picking small or large, but they're going to look for medium. Right. Anyway, thank you, guys. That's all we have for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week, because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.